Our next presenter is Dr. Donald Fairbairn. He's the Academic Dean of Gordon-Conwell Charlotte Campus, the Robert E. Cooley Professor of Early Christianity. His paper is Fides Que Perditur, the Nicene Background to the Reformation. So please have a seat so we can give him our full attention. As I speak this evening, I am going to ask that if you have a question you want to ask me afterwards, you write it down as I am speaking. And the reason for that is that, as some of you know, I am almost completely deaf and will probably not understand the questions if you ask them in a room of this size. So if you could write the question down and then give it to me during the question time, I will read it and then do my best to answer it. I'd like to speak about fides quae creditur question mark, the Nicene background to the Reformation. I often tell my students that our natural tendency as we deal with historical documents is not to read forwards, but to read backwards. And what I mean by that is that we have a tendency unconsciously to read writings from a given time period in light of what has been done with those ideas later, rather than in light of the context of the documents themselves. And I think that has happened with the creeds, and I think that that has led us to fail as Reformation Protestants to recognize the degree to which the ancient creeds, and especially the Nicene Creed, constitute very important background to the Reformation. It is very common for post-Reformation scholars and students to make a distinction between two Latin phrases, fides quae creditur, the faith which is believed, and fides qua creditur, the faith or the trust by which it is believed. That distinction is, for the most part, a post-Reformation distinction. And when we think about the creeds in light of that distinction, we tend to assume that the creeds are giving us the what. They have to do with fides quae creditur, the faith which is believed. They provide the content. Furthermore, we have often heard that the ancient creeds emerged in the context of theological controversy, most notably the Arian controversy as the background to the Nicene Creed. And that is true, or at least it's partly true. And so we tend to think that creeds are about doctrine. And that is illustrated by the fact that among Protestant traditions that still recite the creeds, we usually introduce them by saying, Christians, what do you believe? Christians, what do you believe? So if we think that creeds are about the what of Christian faith, then as Protestants, they may bother us a little bit. First of all, they may bother us for what they seem to omit. Where is sola scriptura in the creeds? Where is sola fide, the subject of this evening, in the creeds? Where is justification in the creeds? But the creeds may also bother us for what they include, the Holy Catholic Church. Haddon Robinson was once fond of quipping that as a boy, he never understood why we as Protestants were giving the Catholics so much free press every Sunday when we <laughs> recite the creed. And some of us may be concerned by phrases like one baptism for the remission of sins. So you see, if we treat the creeds as if they are many confessions, doctrinal statements about the what, the content of the Christian faith, then they may disturb us. In fact, they may lead us to be suspicious or even embarrassed. We may not recite the creeds at all. or If we do, very likely only the Apostles' Creed. Most Protestants know the Nicene Creed only by name and the Athanasian Creed not at all. Most important, we may see the recitation of the creeds as being at odds with Reformation Christianity. We wish the creeds were more like the confessions, more obviously biblical, less Catholic. 
that attitude, whether conscious or unconscious, that we may have toward the creeds, in my opinion, comes from seeing them as being about fides quae creditur, about the what or the content of the Christian faith. But let's try to get behind that distinction between fides quae and fides qua. As I mentioned, the distinction is basically a post-Reformation distinction. It is sometimes traced back to Augustine, although he does not use those phrases in the sense that I have just given to them. It is sometimes traced to Aquinas, although the phrases almost never occur in Aquinas' writing. For the most part, it is a distinction that emerged in the 17th century. A scholar on whom I, I have relied summarizes, one does not speak of fides quae creditur until one begins to rep represent the object of faith in terms of content, in terms of doctrine, in the modern sense. I would like to suggest that the distinction between fides quae and fides qua was not only alien to the framers of the creeds themselves, but it was also alien to Luther and the early reformers as well. And so I'd like us to get behind that distinction and take a deeper look at Christian identity as it would have been construed and was construed by the framers of the creeds. Christian identity or faith, if you will, of course is not just about what we do. It is not even just about what we believe. Much more important, it is about in whom we believe, to whom we belong, by whose name we are called. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. At the very center of Christian identity is not what doctrine as content, even though that is important, of course, but at the very center is a name, the name of Jesus Christ. And so I would like to suggest that we sort of summarize Christian identity by saying something like this, the one in whom we trust is the one to whom we belong. The one in whom we trust is the one to whom we belong. And if we think about Christian identity that way, rather than simply thinking about faith in a content versus the trust by which we believe that content, then I think it will help us to understand the creeds more accurately and to understand how they constitute background to the Reformation. So what I would like to do now is to get behind the fourth century Arian controversy and look more deeply at the origin and the purposes of creeds in general. Creeds begin with the primal affirmation of the Old Testament. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This, of course, is not a creed per se, but it was the defining statement of Israel's identity. In contrast to the nations around us that believe in a jumble of different gods, we affirm there is only one God. He is undivided within himself, and therefore our loyalty to him is to be undivided. This is the great shaper of the identity of the people of God in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we find that great centerpiece of Israel's identity reaffirmed. Paul writes, for although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist. You notice this, this is not simply a bare affirmation. This is also a statement of allegiance. Those other gods to whom the nations around us are dedicated are so-called gods. There is one God, the Father, clearly implied 
we owe our loyalty, our allegiance to this one God. But of course, as the New Testament echoes the prime, primal creed-like affirmation of the Shema, there's a complication. And some of you already realize that complication because you realize that I only have half of the verse on the screen. The second half of the verse reads like this. And one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we exist. It is sort of like this. The Bible is drawing a hard line between God and everything else. But the Bible is also affirming Jesus goes above the line, not below the line. And of course, there's another complication as well, and that is that there's a third person referred to and associated with the Father and the Son. 2 Corinthians 13, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And of course, in Matthew 28, baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Here's the hard line. There is one God, but the Son goes above the line, not below. The Spirit goes above the line, not below. In addition to complicating the affirmation of allegiance to one God, the New Testament also gives us creed-like statements that summarize the life of Christ, like this one in 1 Corinthians 15, or this longer one in Philippians chapter 2. And in summaries of preaching in the Old Testament, in the, book, in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, and these excerpts from creed-like statements in Paul's letters, we see the life of Christ and the events of the life of Christ recited with an almost creed-like kind of allegiance. So in the Bible, I would like to suggest that creed-like affirmations tend to include at least two of the four items that are on the screen right now. A confession of the one God, the Father. A confession of Jesus Christ, linked to the Father, a summary of the events of Christ's earthly life, death, and resurrection, and an affirmation that the Holy Spirit is linked to the Father and the Son. Ultimately, the background to the creedal statements of the early church is not just theological controversy. It is the creed-like statements of the Bible itself. We owe our loyalty to one God, to his Son, who has come to earth, who has lived, who has died, who has risen, and to his spirit. So if we look past the end of the New Testament and into the second and the third centuries, what we find is that even apart from theological controversy, creeds emerged in several different ways. First of all, as summaries for use in preaching, like what we had in 1 Corinthians 15 or in Philippians chapter 2. And even more important than that, declarations for use in baptism and later in public worship. Typically in baptism in the second and the third centuries, the creeds would be recited in an interrogatory form. Do you believe in God the Father? Yes, and the person is baptized. Do you believe in his son who came to earth, who lived, who died, who was raised? Yes. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the lordly and life-giving one? Yes. And eventually those interrogatory creeds were turned into declaratory creeds. Eventually the creeds became longer because they had to add specific assertions related to doctrinal controversies. But we need to recognize that the creeds did not originally arise simply as a way of defining correct doctrine. They originally arose out of scripture as a way of affirming our allegiance to God. Creeds were never simply about what we believe. Much more fundamentally, they were vehicles for community expression of our allegiance to God, to Christ, and the Holy Spirit. 
In an American context, I think it is very helpful to think of creeds as the Christian Pledge of Allegiance. We are pledging our loyalty to God. And so these statements are not meant to be comprehensive, not even as comprehensive as the later confessions were. They are not meant so much to talk about the what as they are meant to talk about the in whom and to whom we are pledging our loyalty. For example, in the greatest of the creeds, the Nicene Creed, it begins, we believe in one God, the Father all-powerful. And it continues, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. And then it continues, and in the Holy Spirit, the holy, the lordly, and life-giving one, proceeding forth from the Father, co-worshipped and co-glorified with Father and Son. At heart, the creeds are a threefold pledge of allegiance to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Looking at them this way should lead us to realize that omissions, even striking omissions like not speaking directly about justification by faith, are not nearly as serious as we might think they were. The purpose is not to describe doctrine in any detail or to describe doctrine at all. The purpose is to name and pledge our allegiance to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's a little bit about the general background behind the creeds. What I would like to do now, though, is to talk for just a few minutes about the specific background to the Nicene Creed. And I'd like to try to relate that to the Reformation. From the point of view of our discussions this evening, focused on sola fide, the great question about the Nicene Creed is, why doesn't it mention justification by faith? Of course, that's a Protestant question, but it's an appropriate starting point. And what I would like to do is to suggest that the Nicene Creed covers justification by faith, just in a rather different way from the way we are expecting. Let me explain. We need to pay attention to what the Creed does not say, as well as what it does say. One of the striking things about the Nicene Creed or about the Apostles' Creed for that matter, is that there's absolutely no mention of what we are supposed to do. We believe in the Father. We believe in the Son. We believe in the Holy Spirit. We do not say anything at all about what we have to do. And I would like to suggest that by omitting any reference to ourselves at all, the Nicene Creed is implicitly affirming that we cannot trust in our own actions for salvation. It is persistently, week after week in worship, directing our attention to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, as if to say between the lines, not to ourselves, not to what we do. Because you see, part of what's going on with trustification by faith is that we are affirming that we have to trust another to save us. We cannot trust ourselves or anything that we could do. And so I would like to suggest that the Nicene Creed is affirming justification by what it omits, by utterly and completely omitting any reference to what we are supposed to do. One of my colleagues recently asked me, one of our Charlotte faculty members recently asked me, don't we need an expansion of the creeds because the creeds don't talk about orthopraxy. They just talk about orthodoxy. And my response was, well, we very likely do need expanded statements of what constitutes orthopraxy. But those statements wouldn't be creeds because creeds are not about us. They are about the one to whom we declare our allegiance. So one of the ways that the Nicene Creed affirms, or implicitly affirms, justification by faith is by its omission of any reference to what we might be able to do. But beyond that, I would like to suggest that the Nicene Creed goes further, and it actually affirms 
what we call justification by faith very positively through a very important phrase at the exact center of the Nicene Creed. This is the second paragraph, the middle paragraph of the Nicene Creed. This is the paragraph about the sun. A few minutes ago, I had the initial part of the paragraph highlighted. But now I want to call your attention to what's in yellow here. The top half is about the son in relation to the father in eternity. The bottom half is about the son's life on earth. It is reminiscent of Galatians, I'm sorry, of 1 Corinthians 15 and Philippians chapter 2. But notice that the transition between who the son is and what he has done constitutes the exact center of the creed. If you, look, if you look at the whole creed, and I can't put it all on one slide very easily, but if you look at the whole thing, the middle of the middle paragraph is the middle of the creed. And what does that say? For us humans and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. Let's think for just a minute about that statement. He came down from heaven. In Greco-Roman thought, heaven was construed in many different ways. What salvation involved was construed in many different ways. What the god or the gods were like was construed in many different ways. But what all of these had in common was that whatever salvation involves, the belief was we have to accomplish it ourselves. Greco-Roman religion, whether it be the high philosophy or the low ritual observance revolved around our rising up to God. In direct contrast to that, Christianity affirms we cannot rise up to God. God has to come down to us or we cannot be saved. And there are many descents of God to us in scripture, but as we speak of Christian salvation, the most significant ones are the descent of the Son through the incarnation and the descent of the spirit at Pentecost and through his indwelling in believers. We cannot rise up to God. God has to come down to us. This is the fundamental contrast that Christians are making between themselves and the thought of the pagan world. What does that imply? Two major implications of that. First, if we are to be saved, remember this hard line. The Son and the Spirit have to go above the line. If they don't, then when the Son comes down, it isn't God coming down to save us. When the Spirit comes to indwell us, it isn't God coming down to save us. The Son and the Spirit must be above the line. Second implication, the Son really had to come down. If anybody is interested in taking my course on the Trinitarian and Christological controversies, this is the whole idea right here. The Son and the Spirit have to be above the line, and the Son has to really come down. It is really that simple. And so in light of that, go back to this statement in the Nicene Creed. The Son is light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, homoousios with the Father. He goes above the line. And the Holy Spirit is the lordly and life-giving one who is worshipped and glorified together with the Father and the Son. He goes above the line. And then again, the sentence in yellow. For us humans and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. I would like to suggest that the Nicene Creed is affirming what we call justification by faith and what Paul calls justification by faith just as insistently as when we do when we expound on the way Paul uses that phrase in Romans and Galatians, but in a different way. The affirmation is we cannot rise up to God. God has to come down to us. The Son who is equal to God has come down. The Spirit who is equal to God has come down. And so 
What I'm suggesting this evening is that our embarrassment, perhaps, with the creeds is misplaced. They aren't meant to be about the what of salvation. They are meant to be about the who of salvation, about the one to whom we belong, whose name we bear, in whom we trust. And they do not actually, at least the Nicene Creed does not actually fail to affirm justification by faith. It just affirms what Paul and we call justification by faith in a different way. I would like to suggest one more thing in addition to this. And that is that the creeds, with their affirmation of allegiance to the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, are essential background to the Reformation. Because you see, if we talk about justification by faith in and of itself, it's easy to focus too much on the person who has the faith and to turn faith into a pseudo work in spite of our best intentions. In order for the focus on justification by faith not to be distorted, it has to be preceded by a clear understanding. Our faith is not just in something, it's not just a matter of what. Our faith is in someone, or better, someones. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And so I would like to suggest to you, as I have suggested to my pastor and others, that when we recite the creeds, and I hope you will from time to time, we introduce them not by saying, Christians, what do you believe? Because the creeds are not an answer to that question. I suggest instead that we say, Christians, in whom do you believe? We believe in one God, the Father, and in Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of the Father, and in the Holy Spirit, the Lordly and life-giving one. Amen. So if anybody has a question written down, looks like we have one coming up. Thank you. A question, to what extent does Luther lay out and enumerate the extent and the boundaries of authority in patristic and conciliar traditions? Does he simply evoke these sources of which he approves, especially Augustine and the Nicene Creed? In particular, how far is Luther willing to delve into the seven ecumenical councils? It's a very good question, and unfortunately, I cannot answer it, at least not directly. And one of the ironies of my presence this evening is that I'm not a Reformation scholar, and so why am I speaking at a Reformation conference? So if you will permit me to deflect the question from Luther to the fathers themselves, it is, it is clear from a fair bit of what the fathers say, that they understood the authority of councils and of individual fathers as being strictly derivative. In times of theological controversy, everybody went back to the Bible, and they affirmed and debated, disputed, discussed the Bible itself. And there are several major statements, most notably by Augustine, which emphasize that the Bible is in a category by itself. And then beneath the Bible with less authority are major councils and then minor councils and then individual statements by individual theologians. So even among the church fathers themselves, there's a very definite ranking of authorities. And again, I, I can't answer the question related to Luther, but I, I assume that Luther would have recognized and would have agreed with that ranking of authorities underneath scripture as the highest authority. Gord is not, and that, does that sound right? Uh, oh, okay, I thought you were gonna. Well, let, let me just speak okay. real, real quickly. Uh, uh, in the Augsburg Confession, uh, the introduction basically says, uh, we affirm 
the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Athanasian Creed. On these points, we have no conflict with the Catholic Church. And uh, then the evangelical theologians went on from there. So there was a full acceptance of the early tradition. And you know, really, uh, they spent a great deal of time uh, thinking about and uh, rehearsing what the early church fathers had to say. Yeah, thank you, Gordon. OK, another, yep. another question. This will be our last one. Would you agree that the creeds, because they are Trinitarian, also imply a Christian biblical hermeneutic? Short answer, yes. <laughs> Maybe a little bit longer answer. Uh, one of the things that I think the Church Fathers can help us with related to our own interpretation of Scripture is that they can remind us of the importance of moving from the big picture to each individual passage, not just from each individual passage to the big picture. Our hermeneutics tends to start with each passage in its own background and then to move to the big picture of the whole of the Bible. The Church Fathers typically moved in the opposite direction. They interpreted each passage in light of their perception of what the entire message of the Bible was. And among the church fathers, most of the time, the perception about the entire message of the Bible is that it is a Trinitarian message about the Son in relation to the Father and less so about the Spirit in relation to the Father. That led them to an over-exuberance in the Old Testament, and I will free freely admit that their Old Testament interpretation is sometimes rather fanciful. But it's an over-exuberance that's based on a main idea that I think is exactly right. The Old Testament is a book pointing to Christ. The Bible as a whole is a book about Christ. And so it's important for us to recognize that even if we want to say you're getting a little carried away in the way you interpret certain Old Testament passages. So yes, the Church Fathers, most of them did have a, a very Trinitarian and especially Christological kind of hermeneutic with which they looked at all of Scripture. 